Amen, amen. All right, we're going right to Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. It's on your screens. It says this, But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. What a power verse. So this is Joshua. He's the leader of God's people after Moses had passed away. And Joshua has this moment where he comes and he presents to God's people a clear choice. Who are you going to serve? And it's massive. It's massive for them and it's massive for us because let's be real. Here we are in January and you can look back at last year and maybe make some kind of an assessment of who did I serve last year? Where were my priorities? Where was my passion in my heart? And as I go into this new year, who will I serve? My mom named me after this guy. It was a big deal. We had that verse on a plaque. Anybody have this verse on a plaque growing up in the house? Some of you did. It's a big deal. I love just, as for me and my family, we'll serve the Lord. So Joshua and his family, they are generation one. It's a radical faith. They saw the miracles of God. They loved God. Here's Judges chapter 2, verse 7. It says this, And the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, and the leaders who outlived him, those who had seen all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. In verse 10, After that generation had died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that he had done for Israel. And so you've got three generations kind of in view. Generation number one is, is Joshua and all those people. See, they had seen Moses part the Red Sea. And it was a big deal to them. And not only had they seen the miracle, but they'd been changed by it. Like they got to know God, got to love God. And then the generation that came after them did not necessarily experience the miracles of God, but they knew their parents and they listened to the stories. And then a third generation came along and they didn't even know the stories, is what Judges is saying there. They didn't even know the stories. And they didn't know and serve God. So we're going to talk about that today. Can I have the chairs, please? Uh, we're going to have some chairs brought up onto the stage right now. We're going to talk about these generations out of the book of Joshua. Uh, one generation, Joshua's generation, the generation after him, the kids, and then the grandkids as well. And as you see these unfold, what I'm hoping you'll do is see yourself in one of those chairs. See your family in one of those chairs. Would you give them a hand, the chairs people, a hand, please? <clears throat> So generation one, like they saw the Red Sea part. They, they were at Jericho when the walls came a-tumbling down, amen? And it's not just about seeing God's power. See, what happened when they saw that? See, when, when the armies of the Pharaoh were coming against God's people and then God parted the waters, what did they see there? But God's love and protection in that moment. There was power but the character of God was on display, and they were his children, and they felt loved by him, amen? And then when they were at Jericho, and they come to the most defended city in Canaan, and this was the enemy of enemies for them, and God says, hey, when you go to Jericho, I don't want you to attack it, I just want you to march around it and sing. What's he telling them? I've got you. Like, I've got you, and it's not going to be about your effort, no matter what this world and this culture tells you. It's going to be about what I do for you, and that's the way that this relationship is going to function. So they have a miracle, but they have a miracle that invites them into relationship with God. Now, this crew comes along, second chair, and they hear the stories from them. But the stories, and don't miss this, the stories aren't just any stories that they hear growing up from them, right? They're not just any stories because when they tell them the stories, even though they weren't there at Jericho, they feel the heat off mom and dad. Mom and dad believe this. Mom and dad live it. They love God. They'll do anything for God. 
And so when mom and dad with that kind of integrity and passion are telling their kids while they're being raised there, they know mom and dad are for real. And because mom and dad are for real, that must mean the stories are real. And they put their faith in God. But then the grandkids come along. And the grandkids hear the stories from them. And the grandkids are like, really? The, the walls fell? Walls don't do that, mom and dad. What are you talking about? Moses raised up a staff and all of a sudden the water just shoots up into the sky? What are we talking about right now? Science figure, I, like what, what is this? And they don't necessarily believe. And part of the reason that they don't necessarily believe is because second chair, they didn't necessarily have the experience with God the first chair did. And so what you've got is you've got second-hand faith and third-hand faith. Isn't that the way that it goes? So how about maybe some of your parents had this massive moment with Jesus Christ where they hit rock bottom. And when they hit rock bottom, they reached out to Jesus like some kind of an anchor and said, you got to save me because everything's falling apart. And they had that kind of testimony. And Jesus did save them. And they built their entire life around what Jesus had done in their heart. And it was real. And the thing is, they had a miracle. And maybe it, wasn't, maybe it wasn't Mount Sinai, but they had a miracle inside of them. And so when you grew up in their house, you felt the heat off of their faith, did you not? You felt the heat. You felt the passion and the love. You knew they were for real. And so when they told you about the miracles of God and the truth of God, you 100% believed them. But you, you grew up in the church. And you grew up with them. And you knew they had this miracle, right? But, like, but you watched everything that they did, and you saw their integrity, and you saw the way that they lived, the, their morality, all the choices that they made. You saw the, how they went to church, how they gave money to the poor. You saw how they went to life group. You saw all these different things that they did. And what starts to get a little bit confusing is you start to think, as a second chair Christian, you start to think it's the things that they did that made them who they are. It's all the stuff. It's all that lifestyle. And so if I just do the lifestyle, I'm good too. What you miss is the miracle that happened inside of their soul because none of the stuff matters without the miracle. Right? And then your third chair, and you grow up with them, and they know how to do all the stuff, and they start to raise you, and they're like, hey, do all the stuff. Believe all the things, and it's all real, is it? Any of that sounded familiar at all to anybody? It's about did the life change happen Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says this. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. It's a massive verse. What does it say? It says, based on your lifestyle and your choices, you can do things that bring sorrow to the heart of God. You can cause God pain. Did you know that? Your choices can cause God pain. The question is, does it matter to you? Do you care? Because that's the difference here. These guys actually love their Savior. That's the foundation of it. There's a love that's here. There's a lifestyle here. One can be empty religion and secondhand faith, and it's not real. And that verse says, based on your behavior, you may be causing God pain and sorrow. You know, we tend to say things like, hey, this is no big deal. It's a victimless crime. 
hey, that's, nobody got hurt there, right? Like, like my sexual behavior, nobody got hurt by that. But Jesus cares. You know, when I cheated on my taxes, nobody got hurt by that except a greedy government who did not need a little bit more money from me. But was that the point? Because Jesus said one thing. And do we care? It doesn't matter if we can connect the dots necessarily and see why he said what he said. If Jesus said it, it's enough. See, the first chair, if, if Jesus said it, it's enough. Done. But here we start evaluating which things. All you got to tell me is that, that it causes God pain, and it's done. And that's it. My life belongs to him. I care about what he cares about. Why? I love him. Why do you love him? Because he loved me. Not just saving me from hell, he loves me. So how does a second chair operate? Here's issue number one with a second chair. You're moral, but you don't care about God himself. You know what all the rights are, and you know what all the wrongs are, you know all the lists, you might know them by heart better than me. But you do the right thing because you don't want to get caught. Or you do the right thing because you don't want to look bad and you're protecting your reputation. But there's no heart change. And that's everything. And I don't mean perfection today. Somebody amen that. I don't mean perfection. Amen. Because I don't care which of these you're in. None of them are perfect. It, it's not about measuring who's doing it better that's not it at all. That's where the Pharisees got it wrong. It's about whether or not a miracle has taken place inside of you. And if the miracle's taken place inside of you, then Jesus becomes real and you love him and everything starts to change. Issue number two is you're self-reliant and you're not relying on Jesus. I rely on myself. And this is what the Pharisees did, right? Like they'd walk up in groups to Jesus. Do you remember these scenes? They'd walk up in groups to Jesus, and Jesus is sitting there, and he's teaching. And, and they're, they're, they, their noses are kind of up in the air. And, and it's like, get him, Jesus. Tell him what's what. Not like, no, I tell them, because I went to church this week, and I tithed, and I did all the things that I'm supposed to do. I did all the things that I'm supposed to do. But look at them. So tell them, Jesus, but I'm fine. Man, my family's fine. The kids are fine. None of them are in therapy at all. The marriage is fine. Don't look too close, though. But, it's, but I did all the things. And I did all the things, and I feel confident in all the things. And so I don't need. And so I'm self-reliant. I'm good. And that's the way I like to operate. Because when I walk in the room, I want that confidence to be on me. Right? Because that's strength, and that's power, and that's how I roll. Right? And when I'm religious, it all, it all gets tied up in that. And your kids see the hypocrisy of all that. Because they know what's really going down. Self-reliant, not relying on Jesus. Jesus, instead of all that nonsense, he said it's the tax collector that's on the other street corner and he's beating his chest and saying, have mercy on me, God, a sinner. And Jesus is like, it's that guy who went home justified that day. And that guy did not outperform morally the other guy. It's, not, it, it's never what it was about. It was about surrender. Issue number three with second chair Christians is they are sold out to the things that they want, not sold out to Jesus. Sold out to the things that they want, all the stuff. What's in the center of your world? 
ask your closest friends and family, what's in the center of your world? It's not what you say it is. Right? It's like, when I go to college, why am I choosing my major? Why am I choosing my career? Why am I choosing my next job? Why am I choosing whether or not to move or not move? Jesus, whatever it is that you want from me, whatever it is that you have for my family, I want that. Versus, where's the money? Versus, what career, if I choose this career, it's got the best income stream possible for my future? My financial stability, my future retirement, the bigger car, all of it. What, what's the question that's in my heart? See, the question that's in your heart, that determines what's the center of your life. I'll do anything I can just to get that person who is attractive to me. And that's, it, it's all about that. Or I'll do everything I can just to make sure the kids are happy. And see, the answers to all those questions, it tells you what the center of your life actually is. You're sold out to something. See, these guys, they're sold out often to money. It can be other things. But Jesus isn't in the center over there. Next issue is that the testimony is from long ago. It's not from yesterday. Second chair Christians, they get really good at telling you their story. And when I was 20 years ago, I had sin. You're supposed to laugh at that. When it's 20 years ago, and I was a mess, and here's my testimony, and here's my story of how everything got better, because everything's better now. And I've arrived now. Because Jesus. It's so good. It's all 20 years ago. These guys, get them talking. Right? Let me tell you about last week. Let me tell you about last week. And there's this moment. And God spoke to me. Exactly what I need to hear. Absolutely blew my mind. Life-changing truth. Showed me this thing. And all of a sudden, the Father, the God of the universe, spoke to me, his son. Oh my gosh. It's not even the word that he gave me. It's the fact that he took his time to speak to me. He's still doing miracles for me. Right? Like it's all real and alive. It's not about is it morally pure. It's about is it alive or not. And it's like, I repented 20 years ago? Really? No, no, no. I'm repenting right now. All the time. Like a week ago, I'm talking to this person, and the way that I react to them, it's terrible. I've got all my defenses ready to go. I'm fired up. I was totally in the right. They were totally in the wrong. The Holy Spirit comes in and says, are you sure about that? Holy Spirit comes in and says, you know, maybe you reacted this way because of this thing in your past. And, da, 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 da. and he starts speaking. It's like, oh my gosh. And so we got to confess that to that person. And we got to go and repent, ask forgiveness from that person, right? And it's like, wait a second, but you've been a Christian for three years. doesn't matter. Thank God. Because one inch at a time, could I be a little bit more like Jesus Christ, please? Because what does that mean? It means he's not given up on me. It means I'm not stuck in my ways. The fact that this is still alive and it's still event an adventure? Oh, God, bring me that. Give me a testimony that's yesterday because that means the power's still on. Last one is that we have a relationship with Christian culture and not with Christ himself. And if you're, a, if you're a teen today, if you're college today, you need to hear this today. We all need to hear it today. You really need to hear this today. Relationship with Christian culture. You can fall in love with Christian culture. Did you know that? You can fall in love with the morality of Christianity because you've tasted that morality before. You tasted just enough of it, and it did make you a better person, and you could feel it. 
I started to do these things instead of what the world does. And I started to see some benefit that came into my life. I I became a better person. My family became a better family because I just tasted some of the morality that Jesus' wise teachings had to offer me. And I can fall in love with that itself. I can fall in love with the music. I can fall in love with the community and the good people that are in the church. And it can be so wonderful that I think this is it. It's not it. I can fall in love with the causes. I can get involved in helping the poor along with the church, protecting the unborn. I can get involved in those causes and, 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 and the sense of purpose and the difference making that we all do together. And I can think that this is it and this is wonderful. I can love the beauty in Christian culture and the church. And I can get all into the beauty of the philosophy and the cathedrals and just the goodness of it all. And some of you grew up in the second chair and you did all of the things and you felt all the impacts and you're like, this is it. It's not it. All that stuff was great. As an example, your marriage is struggling. You take the teaching of Jesus, part of his advice that he offers, and you bring it in and you see your marriage get better. That's great, but it doesn't mean that you made Jesus the center of your marriage. Because when Jesus becomes the center of your marriage, everything changes. And that's every area of your life. Taking a little bit of his advice can fool you. Christian culture is going to fail you, and it is going to disappoint celebrity pastors and lights and music. Amen? Come on. Come on, we know. And the movies, and the politicians, and the Jesus trinkets, right? Authors, musicians, all of it, it will fail you and it will disappoint you. And some of you have fallen in love with that stuff so much. And then what you saw is you saw some of that stuff fail already in your relationship with God. You saw some of that stuff fail or somebody pulled back a veil and it was ugly underneath. Come on. And it was ugly underneath. And then you had a choice to make. And you struggled. So did I. I've seen a lot of failure in the church. And every time I had to embrace the idea that I had connected myself to a Christian subculture, not to Christ himself. Because he'll never fail you. And we got to teach our kids and we got to teach our teens that those are two very, very different ways to live your spiritual life. We have to teach them this. We have to know it. The scripture says that we have this treasure. Do you know this verse? We have this treasure and it is in earthen vessels. It is in broken clay pots. You've got a gorgeous diamond. That's Jesus. And he's presented to this world inside of a broken church. And you're like, God, why would you do that? And the verse tells you, it says, so that people will know that this power is from God and not from us. Nothing that we do is from us. A.W. Tozer says, we should love God because he is God. Beyond this, the angels cannot think. It's God alone. It's Christ alone. Smallpox was a devastating disease. And I know we've got our own diseases right now. Just talk about smallpox for a second. Scholars estimate 500 million people or more died of smallpox. In the 1700s, they developed an inoculation for it. It was a really special process that they had to walk through, and you had to you had to introduce a little bit of the smallpox sickness into your thumb. It couldn't come through your lungs because you just die. But if they introduced it to your thumb, it was just the right way and the right amount of it, and you would actually get sick for a while. Sound familiar? You'd actually get sick for a while, and you had a version of smallpox. It just wasn't deadly. 
And if you survived that, you came out with antibodies so that you wouldn't get the actual thing that would actually kill you. Here's the deal. First chair Christians, they get the miracle that's 100% Jesus, and it kills them. The old life dies. And once the old life finally dies, there's space and room for a new life to begin. Second chair Christians, they just get a little bit. They get a little bit, and they do all the behaviors. They don't get the miracle. And because they've got just a little bit in their system, they think they're okay. And not only do they think they're okay, but they sit underneath preachers like me trying to tell the truth, and they're inoculated to the words. Because they're like, whatever, pastor, I've already said the sinner's prayer 50 times. Amen, me too. But if you didn't have the miracle, you didn't have the miracle. Don't be immune to the gospel. Third chair people, you grew up with those second chair parents where they were religious but did not have the real change. And that messed with you. Can I just acknowledge that that messed with you? You grew up in that kind of a home, it messed with you. And it messed with you to the extent that you're like, this is fairy tales and this isn't real. I don't know why you're in church today, but you are. And I'm just trying to admit this to you. I remember going to college and people would say things like, you know what, those college professors, you know, our Christian kids, man, they, they go off to college and those, those, those secular professors, man, they, they fill them up with a bunch of, you know, science and whatnot. And they talk to them. And then all our kids lose the faith and walk away from the faith. Not true. I went to those colleges and I heard from those professors. And the thing is, if you've had the miracle, you've had the miracle. And that's it. But instead, if you grew up with a mom and dad who acted one way when we're inside of the church building and everything's great, and then when you go home, and you're inside the four walls of home, and you see a very different individual, you're like, it's not real. It's got nothing to do with college professors. Any of this sound familiar at all? Anybody? What chair are you in? You don't have to say it out loud. Not yet. The problem with the second chair is that your faith isn't great and there's no power in it and there's no love in it and you got kind of a miserable version of it and I'm sorry. You got kind of a miserable version of it. The other problem with the second chair is that you're expressing a faith to the third chair and to everybody else in our culture that isn't real and they know it's not real. Revelation 3.14 says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. And this is Jesus talking in the book of Revelation. Um, in the first few chapters, he writes seven, church, seven letters to seven different churches. And this first one is to Laodicea. Verse 15, he says, I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold, and I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The original Greek word is vomit. The translators, they don't like words like that, though, you know? Hot or cold, instead you're lukewarm. What's he talking about? So, so there's actually a historical note about this city called Laodicea, and they did not have their own hot or cold spring in town. And so instead what they had is they had a hot spring that was six miles away. And an aqueduct carried that hot water from six miles away into Laodicea. Laodicea was was not a very strong military town 
Because if anyone would ever come against them with an army and lay siege to the town and surround them, they'd cut off their water supply and they'd be done. They weren't self-sustaining. Water was coming from six miles away. And Jesus is like, I don't like the taste of this water. It doesn't taste good. Which I used to struggle with that. And some scholars would be like, well, you know, he likes cold water better because it's refreshing and hot water is better because, you know, it can purify stuff. I just, you ever drink well water before? Like I read this and I'm tempted to read this as like, you know, bottled water from a fresh spring, you know? It's like, what's, what's, what's wrong with that being lukewarm? Nothing, maybe. But when it's the tap water from the town I grew up in, you didn't want to taste that water lukewarm. You know what I'm saying? You wanted that stuff cold or you wanted it boiled, one of the two. (laughs) Then maybe six miles away it travels before it gets to you. Doesn't taste very good. See, these guys, they've got faith handed down six miles away from them. You see what Jesus is saying? Is you don't have your own. It was handed to you. And secondhand faith is not good enough faith. You need your own miracle. And I know I'm talking about all this negativity about like th- this doesn't go so well in the handoff. But here's the thing. First chairs, some of you guys, we're going to pray for you later. First chairs, we got to stop making our kids think when they grow up in our homes that if they just go to church with us and do all the right stuff, they're going to be good. We need to teach them that they need their own miracle. Because they got to have it. Don't make them wait till they're 18 or 19. Teach them that from the very beginning. Like, I, I love that you come with us. And I love that our faith is inspiring you. But it's got to be real for you. Verse 17 You say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing, and you don't realize, Jesus says, that you are actually wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. There's that self-reliance again. Another little historical note on Laodicea for you. In A.D. 60, the Roman historian Tacitus recorded that in A.D. 60, a massive earthquake hit Laodicea, leveled the town. It needed to be rebuilt. So Rome, Imperial Rome, offered them money to help with the rebuilding effort. Laodicea turned it down. They were so wealthy. They turned it down and said, we'll rebuild ourselves. How's that for self-reliance? They had it all. They're like, we got this. No big deal. Can you feel the pride on that? We got this. No big deal. And Jesus is like, actually, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Did I leave anything out? (laughs) Actually. And then he says, verse 18, so I advise you to buy gold from me. How do I buy gold from you, Jesus, if you just told me I'm poor? Isn't that the weird thing about the gospel? is we're always told that it's free and that it doesn't cost us anything because it cost Jesus everything on the cross, amen? He paid for it all, all to him I owe. Like, it's, it's absolutely free. And yet, we're always telling you to give your whole life to him. Your whole broken, messed up, Josh Trueblood life. You present it to him in the great exchange, Does it earn it? Heck no. Have you seen my life? Heck no, it's not enough to earn anything. I'll I'll take my pittance and I'll buy gold from Jesus. I'll give him everything. That's what he's saying. Buy buy gold from me, gold that's been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you'll be able to see, Jesus says. You think you're rich, but you're poor. And then verse 19, I correct and discipline everyone I, say it, love. 
So Jesus shows you his cards. Says there's only one reason this conversation is even happening right now. Because I started there. I started with love. And I saw that you were blind. You, you said you had everything. I could have left you there. But now nah, I love you. And it's the people that I love that I come and I'm going to bring correction. So be diligent, he says, and turn from your indifference. Be diligent there. Some of your translations say be zealous or zealously repent. That word actually means hot. Let's go back to the Greek. It's the same Greek word that he used before. He said, you're neither cold nor hot. Instead, you're lukewarm. And so now when he tells you what he wants you to actually do, he says, get hot and repent and turn from your old way of life. Look, I stand at the door and knock. Do you recognize that? I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together with you as friends. Love that. I love that because Jesus doesn't say it's time for you to clean up your life. But we're always afraid that he's going to say to us. Instead, Jesus offers you a miracle. He offers you a miracle, says all you got to do is open up the door. If you open up the door, I'll come in and do everything. Everything's going to be on me. That's why it's like, you're going to get this gold from me. You're going to get those garments from me. You're going to get this eye salve from me. I'm going to provide all of it. You just got to let me in. Get hot. Repent. So here's a question. Are lukewarm Christians really Christians? Read the commentaries. They're divided. They don't know. And I don't know. Because this entire thing is written to a church, which would imply they're Christians. But when you get right down to it at the very end, Jesus comes knocking and their hearts are in one place and he's not inside. He's on the outside asking to get in, which implies the other. I don't know. The good news is, is that Jesus is knocking Amen. and that he hasn't given up on us. Matthew 9, 9 says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Once there was a man named Matthew. Matthew was a Jewish man. He was a tax collector. He lived in a Jewish city. And if you know anything about tax collectors, you knew that, know that they were often stealing from their countrymen. They were hated, cut off, but man, they were wealthy. They had money. And so there's this man, and he's in this tax booth, and Jesus comes along. And ask yourself the question, what did he do to earn Jesus' miracle here? Nothing. Nothing. Why did Jesus choose him? Loved him. That's it. Sitting in his tax collector's booth. I love the picture. I'm reading the picture to you today because I love the picture of somebody who's, who's in their little booth of protection. And I got my stuff. And this is what I'm depending on. And this is my life. And Jesus comes and says, leave it. Leave it and follow me. And the only way you know that the miracle actually worked is because he left. If Matthew hadn't left the booth, you wouldn't know. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Say new creation. New creation. That means they've been recreated. That's the miracle. That's the Bible saying you're the miracle. And that's, that's the beginning of all of it. And if the miracle has actually taken place, because some of you guys are up here looking at these chairs, and you're like, I don't know if the miracle has taken place in me. If it did, you left something. You left a booth. You left an old way of life. You left something. Because Jesus called you out of it. Did you leave? That's the question. See, the second chair 
I told you it inoculates you. I told you how powerful it is. I told you how terrible this thing is. You, you have to get out of this. You have to get rid of it. You have to get violent about it. You have to hate it. You have to hate everything that this thing stands for, right? You have to. The odds are against you. They really are. This lukewarm thing, this is not new to our culture and our generation. This has been going on a long time. You see it back in Joshua in the Old Testament. This has been going on a long time. There's danger with that thing. I'm like, I'll figure this out some other time. There isn't any other time, right? I'm not trying to sell you on anything. I'm just telling you there's got to be a hatred about that. You're going to have to burn it down. This whole way of life of like, I can live this religious life with all these activities and it's okay if I don't have a miracle inside me. It's okay if I don't have a burning passion for God. That's what you've been telling yourself for decades. Stop settling. It's killing you. Burn it down. Jesus wants everything from you. People came along to you and they told you that this Christianity thing was such a great deal for you because Jesus was just going to ask for a little prayer from you and then he was going to give you everything. And none of that worked out. And I'm not going to lie to you today because even though what you're going to give to Jesus in the tax booth that you're going to walk out of, even though it's not very much in the kingdom of God, it's everything to you. So when I tell you that Jesus wants every single minute of the rest of your life devoted to him, that's truth. And he wants every single penny in all of your accounts. He does. And he wants your dreams, and he wants your future, and he wants your retirement, and he wants your cars. He also wants your family, and he wants all of your relationships devoted to him. It's everything. It's everything or it's nothing truly is. That's the demand of Jesus. He says, let me fully into the house. And once I'm in the house, I want every room. And I'm going to change it all. That's the miracle. Amen. You need to know Christ today. I'm going to read a prayer to you. This is by A.W. Tozer, and I don't often read prayers to you, but this one is just one of my favorites, and I just feel like the heart of it is right where we're at. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to, we're going to do one of these raise your hands things, and I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to ask you to declare which of these chairs you're in so that I can pray over you. Tozer says this. He says, Father, I want to know thee. And I know it's kind of King James. Can we get over that? Is it okay? He says, Father, I want to know thee, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. And I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a part of my living self, so that thou mayest enter and dwell there without a rival. Then shalt thou make the peace of, place of thy feet glorious. Then shall my heart have no need of the sun to shine in it, for thyself wilt be the light of it, and there will be no night there. In Jesus' name. Would you guys stand? It's important you know that Jesus loves all three of these chairs. He loves you and I've prayed for you. And I'm not here to be angry with you or to yell at you. I'm really not. I'm not here to criticize you or to tear you down. But I care and I grieve. And I want you to hear the truth. I hope you heard the truth today. 
what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. We're all going to shut our eyes and I'm just going to ask you to declare if you're a, if you're a first chair person and then we're going to pray for you and then I'm going to ask you to declare if you're a second chair. We're going to pray for you and then we'll get to the third chair. And I'm going to try not get them all confused. Amen. And I know we got music playing, but the music doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, it sort of matters. It doesn't matter. We're not trying to build a moment here, really. I'm not trying to sell you on anything. You don't raise your hand today. You don't do anything. You don't pray today. That's between you and the Lord. I'm not trying to close any kind of a deal. Do you get me today? Either it's real or it's not. Either the Holy Spirit is here and he's speaking to you and he's got power for your miracle or he doesn't. And I don't need to build a moment. Just trying to tell you the truth. If you're like, I need another week, man. I need some time to think about this. You take it. I'd rather it be real for you. Don't get caught up. Some of you guys... You got caught up in the past and it was emotional and the music built and you got all fired up and you did the thing and the thing wasn't real. Take it slow this time then. Amen. Let's close our eyes. Bow our heads. You guys online too. If you're in this first chair and you're like, you know, the more we sat there and talked about it, it's like I see that I'm there. And I'm thankful for it. But maybe I didn't make things as clear to to my kids as I wanted to. And maybe there were some moments in my life where the, the fire started to fade and I started to move in the direction of lukewarm. And I want Jesus to fire me up again. I want the world to see how real he is. You first chairs, raise a hand if you want me to pray for you. Yeah. Let's pray. Jesus, for the first chairs here and online, God, we just, we thank you, God, for the blessing of your miracle, Lord, that you've done in our lives, God, and just everything Everything involved in that, Lord, the people that you use, the moment, God, the, the power that you've brought into our life, God, the love. God, we just, we thank you, God. And Lord, we pray, God, that you would purify us again and remind us, Lord, that it's not about the things that we've done. It's not about the Christian life that we've started to walk. None of that earns us anything with you, Jesus, today. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to you. God, I pray that you clarify it again for us. And Lord, we're thinking about the generations after us, God, and whether or not we've clarified this to them, that they need their own miracle. And so, Lord, I pray a blessing on the first chairs today. And I pray, Lord, for conversations, God. And I pray that they would make it clear and that you would give them the words and the wisdom and the courage. Amen. For those of us here who are second chairs, and this is the bigger group of us, If that's you today and you're wanting that miracle, I want you to raise a hand right now because I want to pray for you. Let me know that you're in on this prayer. Amen. Amen. Online, guys, you guys put something in the chat or whatever. You do it however you want to do it. But let somebody know you're being prayed for today. Let's pray, Lord God. We thank you, God, for all the hands raised in this room. And Jesus, I I just thank you, God, that the first step of the miracle, Lord, is when you bring conviction and you tell us the truth, God. And so thank you, God, getting a hold of us today. And Jesus, I pray, Lord, right now for a violence in the second chair people, Lord. And I pray, God, that second chair Christianity would turn into first chair Christianity and that, Lord, you would do a life-giving miracle inside their souls, God, and it would be real this time finally. God, help them to reject empty religion. Help them to reject all the to-dos, Lord, and all the activities and all the Christian culture and hold on to Jesus himself. 
And Lord, when you ask them to leave their tax booth, Lord, I pray they'd come walking. And God, it will be painful. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, give them the strength, please. And God, forgive their sins. Save their souls. In Jesus, amen. And then the last one, we're going to pray for third chairs. And you're like, I grew up with hypocrisy. I grew up seeing a version of Christianity that wasn't real. Feels like that's all I was ever surrounded by. And so here I am today, not really embracing the reality of this whole thing. But God's speaking to me. Now, if that's you today, would you raise a hand? Because I want to pray for you. Yeah. God, thank you. Thank you for those hands, Lord, today. So let's pray. Jesus, for the third chairs, God, it just feels like they've got so much to overcome, so much they've seen. And so, Lord, they come, Lord. What a, what a moment of faith for them, Lord, to come believing, God, in your power, in your reality, God, in your love. And so, Jesus, I pray for a radical salvation, Lord, for these third chairs, God. And I pray that it would be so real for them, Lord God. Turn their lives upside down. Cause them to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Forgive their sins. Save their souls, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, God. We pray. Thank you, Lord, for them. In Christ's name, amen.